Welcome to the Inquisitive Room Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. This is a podcast that brings interviews and insights from all walks of life from a bird's eye view on the reality of being. Hello, everyone. Today, I welcome Sankar Das to the show. He joins the podcast today to tell us about his experience of going from a college student in America to seeking spiritual enlightenment. And during, during this period of time in his life, he decided to give up the material world. And he went to India. And, you know, India is such a, a spiritual place. He went to India and he actually became what they call a holy beggar. So he was on the street. But on the way, he realized that the logic about living and being and obtaining and getting things all the time didn't really sit with him. He didn't resonate with that. And he was seeking, he's a seeker, so he was seeking something, he was seeking something positive to accept because the other side of that felt quite negative to him. So he changed directions. He then hitchhiked west. These are in the days when you could hitchhike. You couldn't do that today. He hitchhiked to San Francisco and he was penniless. But he is a musician as well. So he had his guitar. He became a hippie. He was in the Mission District and, you know, all about it was the new age of love, free love, peace and music. And it was a time of the Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane. All of those Led Zeppelin, they all sort of came up around around that era. And he felt very much within himself a, a very troubled planet that we were on. So he began to just write his songs. And, you know, on this channel, we talk a lot about creativity, how it's harnessed, and what you do with it. So Sankar Shandas channeled, I believe channeled, these songs, what he was feeling into songs. So he wrote hundreds of songs. And he became quite a well-known musician. He shared the stage with lots of the rock bands that I just mentioned. Um, but, you know, he still wasn't satisfied with just being a, an admired musician. And that was something to aspire to on its own. It still is. But he had this burning desire again, towards something spiritual, spiritual enlightenment, finding out what is, what else is there or what's more. And he intuitively knew, and this is so important, his, he listened to his in, intuition, he knew he'd be led soon. So he expressed this in one of his songs and the line goes, do you think I'd waste my time playing around in misery when I'm so close to Nirvana. So this very profound progression of episodes, you know, being being a, an admired musician, getting the chance to play on the same stage as a lot of these famous rock bands, mixing with those people, he felt quite blessed and loved, really, because that was the era of love. And people were, you know, flowers in their hair, peace, man, all of that stuff. So he began to explore different ways to express himself. And suddenly the, the path was revealed to him. So he's going to share that with us today and how he's come to be a Hare Krishna. And his, his memoir, Divine Love Memoir, is a historical spiritual awakening odyssey. So he talks you through uh, how to attain perfection of meditation, spirituality, and even if you call yourself religious. Uh, he talks a lot about that, how to revive your original, very intimate, personal, loving relationship with whatever source you call it. Some call it God, some call it the universe, whatever it is, he talks about how to harness that relationship. And he talks a lot about the powerful leadership to rescue our planet. Our planet is in so much trouble with climate change and so many ways. Negative thought, 
I believe is bringing us down. There's so much negativity. If you work with other people, you will find a mix that some people are quite healthy, I believe very healthy, positive. They can see the light and shade. And then you have people who I believe are mentally ill. They're functioning mentally ill. They're functioning though. So in other words, they can have a job, they can turn up every day to work. But if you look closely, you'll see the cracks. You'll see their paranoia. You'll see their insistence on creating chaos. You'll see their mistrust of people. You'll see the splitting. You know, some people are good, some people are bad. You'll see a lot of that within them. And they make other people's lives miserable because they are miserable. Know that. Please know that, guys. A lot of people, especially in therapy, you come to therapy because you're having trouble with work. And I've had those those um, similar experiences myself. But you you have to see people as they are. And I think and I think that Sankarshan Das could see he, he took his attention off of other people and started putting his attention on himself. And I think that's the key. You must pay attention to other people because it keeps you, it can keep you safe. You get to see who's who's a bit of a mess, who likes to start mess, who likes to get deep in the gossip, who likes to create chaos. And then you unveil their lives. It, however they're living, however they're showing up for you is exactly what's in their heart, is exactly what, how they grew up, what they were taught. And it's very sad. And some of these people are, they might call themselves religious people as well, but you see the chaos underneath and it's fascinating. So you acknowledge that chaos within them, but you turn inward, not outward. You, you must acknowledge it within yourself, but then you turn inward to say, okay, uh, am I going to contribute to their chaos, to what they've already created and continue to create? Or am I going to forge, keep forging my own path, a push back on the chaos, which they won't like, which they will reject. They will try and turn it on to you. Um, and, you know, one of the things to look at, if you, you must, um, I don't know if I talked a lot about it, actually. I did a video on narcissism and dual diagnosis. So I focus more on dual diagnosis, but people who have covert narcissism traits, will often be very paranoid about other people. You know, it's them, it's the way they do, it's the way people work here, it's the way, it's all paranoia. And that is splitting, that is it, it, them and me, them and me. Instead of looking within themselves and notice that, and that way you can um, pray for them, but also keep yourself safe. And the most important thing is call them out. Um, don't be abused, bullied by them, call them out. That's the important thing because it's not for them, it's for you, it's for your energy and it shifts the a, a layer of that negativity that's just bubbling under the universe uh, or on the universe, in within the universe. So Sankarshan Das is going to talk us through, I ask him a lot of questions about, about the judgment that people have about other religions. It's fascinating that you can have spiritual leaders who say negative things about other religions when they're religious themselves. It's absolutely fascinating to me um, that where is their spirituality? What what what's is this just a, a a moniker you have? Is this just a title you have? Are you have you stopped doing your the work on yourself? Is that the case? And I say this with all people who are in positions like that, even counselors, therapists. You must have your supervision. You must keep the work, keep the work going on yourself, because you have to look outward to in order to look inward. What's going on for you? So when I look at myself and I see those people and I think, wow, I, they, I it's shocking that they're supposedly spiritually helping and leading people, but then their behavior is very troublesome as well. 
why does that bother me? And what I realize is that rather than it bothering me, because I'm past that point in my perception of people, rather than it bothering me, uh, you know that saying, I'm not bothered, <laughs> rather than bothering me, it's become observation. It's become for me an observation. I see it's become a I see you. I see you. And therefore I I pray for you. I hope that you find peace. I hope that you can find enlightenment, whatever that may mean. I know some religions may not even believe in it, but you will know people who are enlightened by the way they treat other people. Simple as that. And so I don't care what religion you say you are or belong to. I don't care about any of that. What I'm looking for is how do you turn up in this world and how do you treat other people? That's what's important. And I think the universe, because spirituality has expanded and it's no longer a dirty word as such, you know, um, and people are accepting more that we all have a choice. It It is in the Human Rights Act. As you know, a lot of my work has been advocacy, and although I'm a counselor, and I so I know the law, I know legislation. And listen, Article 9 of the Human Rights Act protects our freedom of thought. It protects our freedom of consciousness, as well as religion or beliefs. And so you can criticize, which which is a oxymoron. If you call, if you belong to a religion, you t attend a service, a mass, or whatever church, whatever you go to, and you do that regularly. Yet you walk out and you criticize the way other people uh, practice their beliefs. You know, sans being it violent or aggressive or anything like that. Uh, and that applies to them as well, these religious people who are aggressive and, and do the horrible things that I can't mention on YouTube because otherwise it gets a strike. But who does all those things, who ends lives and all that stuff, that, that it's such a it's such an oxymoron. You believe in these things and yet you believe that you have the right to unalive people or whatever. So this freedom... It should, it, there should be a tolerant and diverse society. Look it up. Human Rights Act, Article 9. It's not rocket science. It's our basic right. And it, it, so, yes, you can criticize it if you like. But at least I I at least give people the benefit of the doubt that they can choose what they wish to believe. Anyway. This is why I had that. See, I could go off on a tangent because it really is fascinating to me. There's a psychology behind it. Perhaps I'll do a video on that. There is a psychology behind it, and it is connected to paranoia. But it's also, unfortunately, a covert narcissism issue where you believe your way is the best way and the only way. So Sankarshan Das is going to talk to us today. I'm happy to welcome him here. You'll find that our conversation flows quite easily. So let's welcome, and please forgive my rant, let's welcome Sankarshan Das to the show. And hello, Sankarshan Das. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure to be here. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Well, I've read a lot about your work, and you really have had a very interesting journey. But for our listeners out there, can we just start a little bit about how you've come to where you are now? Now, I know, would, would you say that you grew up in a traditional family uh, belief system as such, or religion? How would you describe it? Well, it's a very long story, actually. It's all in my memoir. Plasmabus.com are given the access, but um, how to how to put it in a nutshell? Basically, I, you know, I was a top level student in high school. My dad said, "Son, your college days are going to be the happiest days of your life." And I got there as miserable as hell. <laughs> and he said, "What do you want to major in?" And I said, "I'm thinking, why do I want to major in? Why don't you tell me why? What the meaning of life is?" Then asked me about a major in. They didn't tell me the meaning of life was. So then I heard about something called self-realization. I'm not going to do that and become self-realized. 
I went to this guru and that guru. I got cheated again and again by these bogus gurus that are after money. <laughs> but then I had this realization that uh, that um, you know this the Western world doesn't really offer what I want. So my career choice after after two years of college be be a holy beggar in India. That was my career choice. But <laughs> there was a philosophy in India called Nati Nati, deny, 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 deny. So I wanted to deny everything. But then I, on the way to India, I had a realization, wait, now wait a minute, if I deny everything, denial is also something. So the perfection of denial is to deny denial also and accept something transcendental. So then I, instead of going east to India, I went west to San Francisco on a mission to bring a new era of peace and love to our planet. And I became a famous singer-songwriter. I shared the stage with the the big name bands of the day, the Jefferson Airplane, the Grateful Dead, and I'm becoming famous. But then I realized, now wait a minute, becoming famous is not enough. I want to become, I want to attain self-realization. I got back my original idea. But then I, uh, so I maintained that desire. I also became a famous musician in Austin, Texas, after San Francisco. But that I was. Um, I was trying to figure out what is the perfection of consciousness? And I said, well, Jesus was a self-realized soul. What made Jesus perfect? And I was reading the Bible trying to figure it out. But one day, Eureka, I found it. He says, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. That's what it is. You got to do what God wants, not what you want. And that's the perfection. I had one problem. I didn't know what God wanted me to do. In the Bible... Saul was on his way to Damascus, and God spoke to him, this is your mission. Now you are Paul, and here's your mission. I was waiting for my Damasc Damascus experience, and it wasn't coming. So I was singing, I was singing, a, doing a little set at a vegetarian co-op. I was kind of depressed, but nobody was listening. My musician's ego was like, Phew. but there was one little girl listening to me. An amazing thing happened, because I was waiting for God to reveal to me his mission, but I was, I, this little girl, it was amazing. It was like a mystical thing. This little girl read my mind, if you can imagine them. She said, don't worry, God can hear you. I went, wow, that was mystical. She read my mind, and I was depressed, and I was listening. But then but then I realized, now, wait a minute. I'm waiting for God to reveal me my mission, but my duty is, and I can't hear him. But you know what? She, through through a little girl, you're mean to me. I, you can't hear me, but I can hear you. Wow. So every day I would say, dear God, please guide to me how, um, how you can be your perfect servant. That became my new meditation. And uh, so God heard my prayer. He sent a Swami from Hare Krishna movement, Vishnu Jana Swami to Austin. And he taught me the science not just the sentiment, but an actual precise science of how you can fully surrender to God. And that's what happened. So I I learned from that Swami how to actually, in a very scientific, philosophical way, not just sentiment, but a scientific, philosophical way, how you can fully absorb your thoughts, words, and deeds in the service of God 24-7. So that's what I did. I've been doing that for over half a century now, and it really works. It really works. And it totally liberates you in another dimension of consciousness beyond time and space, actually. It's pretty amazing stuff. It's called Krishna consciousness. You can call it Christ consciousness, Jehovah consciousness, Allah consciousness. It's not a sectarian thing. It's a science of how to reconnect in loving relationship with that person as a source of everything. He has unlimited names, unlimited qualities, but he's the source of everything. And you can actually reconnect with him and be in total, complete, perfect touch with him 24-7. It's an amazing process. So I've been teaching it all over the world, and i got thousands of students. My memoirs there are going to be sold, hundreds of copies going out now, telling about how I came to this consciousness. This is incredible. Yes, we want to talk about your book, The Divine Love Memoir, in a moment. Um, I just gave a, a summary study of what's in the book. All yes. the details are there. If they're interested in getting it, it's easy to find it. Go to blessedwithbliss.com and they get a copy of it. Right there, you can get a copy of the ebook, a saw banner hardbound. Wonderful. I will put a link in the show notes. 
I just want to go back just for a moment to the first sort of quest. Well, I call it a quest. There may be a different word you prefer to use, but do you believe that you were drawn to San Francisco? Why San Francisco? Yeah, the, that's, that's an interesting question. Of course, there had been a big revolution of kindness out there with the hippie movement, Haight Ashbury and the whole hippie scene. Yeah. There was that had happened. This was in the summer of 67. It was called the Summer of Love. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually, I'm actually associated with a person in Denver who had been there in that Summer of Love. So I knew there was something very spiritual and, and then very special that had happened during that Summer of Love. Now it was just, it was about um, 14 months later, in the December of 68. And I was thinking, maybe there's something still going on there. Even the Summer of Love has passed. There must be some remnants of the Summer of Love still happening. So that's why I was drawn to San Francisco, hate Ashbury. The catch-up was left of this famous Summer of Love. Wonderful. Yes, thank you for that. And I'm so glad you said there was something spiritual going on because everything that's been publicized is the Monterey Festival and uh, you know, Woodstock yeah. and um, the hippie movement and um, Timothy Leary and counterculture. That's yeah. what gets publicized. And the summer of love is an expression, but it sounds as though you were more connected to what it really was, which is spiritual uh, transformation or information yeah. or something that helps you to connect. You spoke about... Oh, the first, I, my friend in Denver had turned me into the Hare Krishna mantra. Oh. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. I knew it was a powerful way, a powerful meditation. And I already knew about it. And when I got to Hate Ashbury after hitchhiking all the way from Houston with not even a penny to my name, even throwing my IDs away and throwing my draft card away, which is illegal to cut my relationship with, with the material world. But I got out there, and the first people I met were the Hare Krishna devotees coming out of Golden Gate Park, invite me to their temple. So I was originally, I was actually meant to do that because I connected with the Hare Krishna people then. I wasn't ready to join, but because I thought they were cool, but a little bit too too uh, esoteric for me. <laughs> That's incredible how that happened, actually. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. And then the move to India to... Um, become what you what you describe as a holy beggar. So, can you please explain to people what a holy beggar would? Be? Oh yeah, in in India, you see, there's in Indian society, there's different levels. You know, you can be a worker, you can be a businessman, you can be a politician, but the highest level, the highest rung of the social ladder in Indian culture is to be a holy beggar, a mendicant, they call it. That's considered the top the top level of the, of the Vedic society. Beyond the beyond the uh, workers, the businessmen, and the politicians and warriors, it'd be a, a mendicant or a, a holy beggar who's given up everything to to absorb himself in meditation and teaching others that science. That's the highest level of society in Vedic culture. In America, it's not like the, <laughs> the, the homeless people on the side of the streets. It's a wholly different culture. Absolutely, not just America, but throughout the world. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Yes, okay. So India is one place that many people seek out, especially in England. Uh, you know, it's natural for people to just go to India. It's what everybody does. And it seems to be a, a mecca of some sort. Uh, no, it's described in the occurring gospel of Jesus Christ, even Lord Jesus went to, to India. He studied from the priest there in a town called Jagannath Puri, a big temple. And he picked up some science of very advanced knowledge. He brought it back to Israel and they couldn't handle it. They killed him for it. Mm -hmm. Not even Jesus went to India. It was a very, actually formerly India was the center of the whole world. Even during the, the Renaissance, they were going to India to get the wealth. Columbus actually was trying to find another route to India when he came to America. That's why he called the people here Indians. So India was actually the culture. It was the most highly, most cultural place, the most spiritual place, the most wealthy and powerful place. Actually, 4,000 years ago, this whole planet was one country ruled from India. India used to be the center of the whole planet. 
was now Delhi was formerly the capital of the entire Earth planet. It was all the whole part was one country in those days, five thousand years ago. Amazing place, actually. If you, there's so there's still remnants of that culture there, and it's a pretty amazing place. I go there. I spend many months every year, actually. Yes, I know you've just come from India, actually. Yeah. And I just spent you, two and a half months there, yeah. Yes. And what were you doing? Were you teaching and people? Yeah, I was teaching and also engaged myself in, in, in meditation, on chanting and worshiping. I was doing both things. I was serving myself and teaching and, and, and chanting and also teaching. I have many, many disciples over there also. I was giving many different lectures leading different chanting sessions in, in different places of India. Yeah. Why is it that when we chant or when we repeat a mantra, mm -hmm. that it appears to change and shift our energy and not just our physicality, but our mind? What is it about that? that well, it's actually, in Sanskrit, it's called Shabrabhaman, the sound incarnation of God. It's mm -hmm. Actually... God himself incarnates in the sound vibration. So you, you, you don't have to go to the spiritual world to associate with God. You can, he comes and becomes totally manifest by, in, and when you chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Dama, Hare Dama, Dama Dama, Hare Hare, you're in direct contact with God himself, the source of all existence, directly. So it's pretty powerful. In fact, God himself appeared 500 years ago as Lord Chaitanya, to teach this process, the most powerful, easiest process of, of, of awakening your divine consciousness. Now, actually, everybody is actually a self-realized soul. It's only covered by a cloud of illusion right now. But this Hare Krishna mantra is like a powerful sun that burns away the clouds of illusion to bring you back to your original enlightened state. Everybody is actually an enlightened being within. So when you chant, you get back to your original nature. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, well, that does explain it because it's very powerful. And many people do connect with that consciousness. But as we know, people have different belief systems. So what would you say? I know that in some countries, mainly in America, people tend to have a bit of a negative view of Hare Krishnas. And oh, yeah. It's an un yeah. yeah, it's um it's lack of compassion, understanding, there is something lacking for human beings. And I do understand in my work, we, we always look at why we want to always appear separate, which causes racism, judgment, uh, wars. We like to appear separate. What is it about this particular movement, religion, practice that you believe incites that in people? You see, they think religion is some, just needs some sentiment. Mm. Um, sen just some sentimental thing for less intelligent people. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the, not only Hare Krishna, but now the churches are becoming more and more empty now. Religion is going down. Even though it says in God we trust on the dollar, it actually someday it may disappear from the dollar the way we're heading now, you see. Because people think it's some sentiment. They don't know there's actually a science behind it. Because they're ignorant of the science of God, therefore they look down on religion. But actually, what we um, we teach the, the, the we teach the, the philosophy of the science along with the uh, there's religion and philosophy go together. Then you have the science of God. If you have religion without philosophy, it's mere sentiment. If you have philosophy without religion, it's it's speculation. When you combine religion and philosophy, then you have the science of God, and that's what we teach. And actually, um, if people can understand that, how the scientific approach to God, then it'll become very popular again. Because here they want to think scientifically. What do the scientists say? You see? But this is actually more powerful and more correct than what the scientists say. The scientists say everything came out of a big explosion, the Big Bang Theory. But I ask you, just like you're living in a nice house there, if I told you we take all the, all the, the, all the ingredients in your house and put it in a you know, put it in a stack and threw a stick of dynamite in it and your house came out of the explosion, you think I was nuts. So they want to tell us this beautiful creation with lotus flowers and, and peacocks and, and beautiful trees that all came out of an explosion. They want us to believe that? 
the so-called scientists, it all came out of an explosion. This is ridiculous. So um, we have a scientist more, we have a science which is actually very accurate and very correct and is not a ridiculous product of mental speculation. Yes. And you know, uh, you've probably been asked this before, but a lot of our listeners may be wondering, well, if you were on a quest to find the meaning of life, why did you have to give up all of your material life? It's not necessary, actually. One can remain in a material position. If you're a businessman, remain a businessman. Just like George Harrison, he wanted to give it all, become a monk, and my guru said, no, by you writing those songs, uh, you're doing the best service. So my George Harrison wanted to join our movement, become a monk, probably said, no, you keep writing your songs. That's the best service you can do. So whatever you're doing now, you can remain doing it. You see. But learn how to connect it with, with God. That will be your perfection. Yes, and you can do both. You, yeah, absolutely. If you're, a, if you're a politician, remain a politician. If you're a businessman, if you're an engineer, if you're a student, whatever you're doing, keep doing that. But learn how to connect the science of connecting with God. But St. Caution does, there must be something in that, in giving up everything, because many people do it. So there must be a meaning behind it. Uh, well, that's one option. And see, there, there's one option available. There's yeah. different, in the, in the Vedic culture, there's different, there's the worker class, there's the businessman, farmer class, and the chatriya class, the warriors, and the politicians, and there's also a class of those who renounce everything and just become teachers. That's also a, an option available, but you don't, one doesn't have to do that. It's an option available to become a teacher. Mm. So they want, one of the four different things you could do. Yes, okay. Exactly. Anyone, you, can, you don't have to change. Now, some people may want to become teach spiritual teachers and not go after money and, and fame. So that's an option available. Um, and if we, somebody wants to do that, we encourage them. But if they don't want to do that, we encourage that too. It's an option. That's it. Yes, it's an. What inspired you to write the Divine Love memoir? Oh, I wanted my story is so amazing. I wanted to share it with the world because I know anybody who takes it seriously can can become liberated from all anxieties and attain a higher level of consciousness. Okay. Yes. Because you know, I think it's a perfect memoir. Given your story, I mean, if you're if you're sharing stages with uh, people like the Jefferson Starship, and it it must have been a world that a lot of people aren't privy to, or will never ever be privy to. Even some musicians don't get to that level. So you were uh, creating at a time where it was revered, and people listened, people heard the music. Um, was what was your take on that? Why do you believe? Do you believe it was because you were such a great musician, or you are a very talented uh, musician? It's like I was real popular here in Austin, Texas, on the campus. Um, I I went to the center of the campus and just started doing can, uh, concerts every day, and hundreds of people would come. It was actually against the campus rules, but they allowed me to do it because I did it with that application amplification. So I created a whole reputation as the campus minstrel here in, in, at the University of Texas. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a time of the counterculture when people were looking for something different, and the musicians actually kind of led the way. In fact, one girl, she's one of my fans, said, "You're actually a spiritual master, and your your songs are your teachings." So they people that was a time when people were looking, the, especially the youth, were looking for some something new or something different. The Vietnam War was going on. Um, can't state that demonstrators were shot dead by the police and, and people. And we can, so it was, um, it was a time when people were thinking this culture of our parents is not very good. We have to do something better. It was on the counterculture was a very turn, a very much a, um, a turning point for the youth. Yes. And, you know, really during your time when you were coming up and really playing your music, um, I suppose success because at that time it was a huge big deal. Music was at its peak. I personally think we've lost that, but music was really at its peak. And was it difficult to, although you craved enlightenment, uh, learning the meaning of the world, spirituality, were they linked, or was it was it difficult to not crave the success that some other bands, musicians were were craving at that time. 
perspective, when you're playing at the level that you played uh, during that time, yeah. Ashbury, different festivals, or playing with those popular musicians, was it not tempting to just carry on on that path and become a huge successful musician? Well, actually, I wrote a song about it because um, I, I really felt that um, I didn't. First of all, I didn't. Uh, and one thing is, I was I was popular locally, but I didn't ever hit the big time. Right. I mean, the professors used to ask me to come and sing for their classes, but it wasn't, um, I, I didn't make it financially. <laughs> That's one thing. I couldn't maintain myself by doing it because I got a few gigs here and there, but I could, it, wasn't, it wasn't enough to maintain me financially. So I was forced, and that was one thing, like financially, it was forced to not, I mean, I was a house musician at a vegetarian restaurant. They paid me with a free lunch. That was my pay. Um, so, but I, I, the thing is, when I came to the point of wanting to know what God wanted me to do, and uh, and I still, I still have, I still do music. I, I'm working on some songs right now. I'll be singing them at the Body, Mind, and Spirit Expo coming up in July here in Austin. I mean, I'm still doing the music. I never gave it up. I have some really nice guitars, a nice six string, a nice twelve string guitars. I haven't given it up. I still utilize that for presenting the uh, transcendental knowledge of the supreme i still do it that's wonderful did you were you a natural musician or did you have to take lessons well i i um uh, i had it in my blood because my mother majored in, in voice in college and uh there was a whole folk music revival that made, later on became the hippie movement uh when i was in high school that was the cool thing going on bob dylan and the folk music revival peter paul and mary was considered a really cool thing to do so I used to, I was a guitar teacher at a summer camp. And, you know, I was naturally getting into that groove because I was, <clears throat> my mother was a singer and I, I became a guitar teacher. So when I headed west of California, I didn't think I would, didn't think about becoming a musician. I just carried my guitar with me naturally. And uh, what happened was uh, the, the day I got in Hayes Ashbury, I just said, well, let me just sit down. What to do to bring a new consciousness to the world? So I'll just sit down and sing some songs. And the police came and said, there's a new ordinance. You can't sit on the sidewalk. So the day I decided to sit down, they said, you can't do it. It's illegal. So I was thinking, what should I do? So I just, I became a wandering minstrel up and down the hate, hate Street there. And that's how I began. And I people started encouraging me. They said, you're another Bob Dylan. You're going to make it big. And so I became very encouraged by the listeners. And then I even, you know, became, shared the stage with the airplane and the dead. Um, so the people around me actually encouraged me to do them. Um, so it was kind of like reciprocation. Um, there was a line in a Bob Dylan song, Trevor Meeman, he says, uh, to, stand, to, stand, to, dance, to dance beneath the diamond sky with one hand waving free. So I was singing that song, and one of the hippie girls, she did it. She put her hand in the air dancing to encourage me what I was doing. So I got so much encouragement from my music and the, the use of that day, they gave me great encouragement. In fact, I went to Berkeley, and as soon as I heard me singing, you can come and live with me. You come and stay with me. I got places to stay and free food just to, because I like my music. So I got very much encouraged by the people around me to keep doing it. I wrote 300 songs, and I was very much encouraged by everybody to keep doing that. I got reciprocation from the people for my music, so I naturally kept doing it because I, I was, got so nice reciprocation from them. I want to ask you about the concept of nirvana. Yeah, nirvana means yeah. Nirvana means near means not, and vana means the repetition of birth and death. So right now we're caught in nirvana, the repetition of birth and death, uh, birth after birth after birth. We stay in material existence according to our desires at the time of leaving the body. We take another body. Whatever's in your mind at the time of death, that encourage that takes you to your next body. If a man is thinking of a woman, he gets a woman's body. If a woman's thinking of a man, she gets a man's body, like that. So whatever you're thinking about at the time of death, then you make the love of a dog, you become a dog in your next birth. <laughs> so but, but nirvana means to get out of the cycle of birth and death, to attain the spiritual platform. So that's the idea of nirvana. I see. How to get out of the cycle of birth and death and get back to your original spiritual identity beyond the material existence where life is eternal, full of knowledge and bliss, 
get free from the realm of the temporality, ignorance, and misery, which is the material world, into the spiritual world where life is eternal, full of bliss and knowledge. I see. That's Nirvana. Thank you for that. And how can we attain spiritual enlightenment? Is it different for everyone? Actually, the, there's different levels. Of the, the highest level of spiritual enlightenment is to become a lover of God. Simple thing. Some people want to, to enter into oneness. That's a lower level. Not only That's only temporary. It doesn't last forever. But the eternal perfectional stage is to develop love for God. I see. And would that matter what God people, because there are many gods for pe people. No, there's one supreme, There's only one source for all existence. Some call him Allah, some call him Jehovah, uh, some call him the Father, of the he Heavenly Father, the Father of Lord Jesus. Uh, there, uh, some call him Krishna or Rama. There's only one supreme person, but it's like my father was known by seven different names according to the different relationships he had. Um, so if my father can be known by seven different names, by God is only limited to one name. It doesn't make sense. So God can have unlimited names because God is unlimited. So you can chant any name of God and attain perfection. Allah, Jehovah, Krishna, etc. I see. Okay. Well, that's very inclusive, isn't it? That's um, that's saying, you know, there is one source as such, and it can yeah. be any name that you believe any name for that of that any name that's authorized you can't invent your own name uh, but you have to an authorized name according to god the teachings given in the scriptures yes and can i just ask i know that you say that you had some very profound episodes that led you to the dimension of divine love can you tell us a little oh, yeah. about some of those episodes <laughs> well Well, one thing is this. Um, I was looking for spiritual enlightenment. I was there in Austin, Texas. And uh, one day, um, I'm with my roommate and a couple of his friends. We're having a little watermelon party on 22nd Street, 909 West 22nd Street. Have a little watermelon. We didn't have AC, so we're getting out of the house. And a little watermelon party in, in the front porch, right? And some hippie guy coming, walking down. He looked pretty uh, serene, hippie guy. And he, he invited him to join us. And he said, you can become self-realized by going to the forest. Boy, you got back at my attention. You can become self-realized by going to the forest. Hmm. So that was pretty nice. And then he walked away. There was a popular hangout for the students and hippies there at the UT. And they called the chuck wagons. So I went down to the chuck wagon. And there he was at the table sitting all alone. So I sat down with him. And he told me he was in Austin briefly to visit his parents who were living nearby. And um, just visiting, and then he left. And I had no idea where he went, where he was from. I just knew I had written something special about that guy. Patrick Golan was his name. And um, so these, uh, my roommate had these two friends, Janet and Daryl uh, Basilinda. And they sang one, so I was a miserable, depressed guy, right? So they sang one song there in our apartment, imitate, uh, in, the same style of two famous singers, Richard and Mimi Farina. It was a song called Pack Up Your Sorrows, played with a dulcimer and a guitar. If somehow you could pack up your sorrows and give them all to me, you would lose them. I know how to use them. Give them all to me. So that very much attracted me. I hear I'm depressed, and I need that saying, you can pack up your sorrows sounds good to me. They invited me to join them, moving to Denver. So I took that invitation to at least visit them, right? So I got, I visited them. And then they said, well, you can't stay with, can't live with us forever. You got to find your own place. All right. So I got my own place. I enrolled as a student. Instead of working a job, I enrolled them as a student. So my parents would support me. And lo and behold, who did I meet at the campus in the break room? But it was Patrick Dolan, the same guy. I had no, What's the odds of actually meeting? Doing that, that was mystical. This guy who impressed me about self-realization, and, and even more mystical, he lived two blocks away from me. Can you imagine? That was definitely mystical. Amazing thing. And then one night, in those days, we used to take LSD sometimes. Mm -hmm. So one night, I went over to I went to visit Patrick, and they said, his roommate says, over at Joe's, I went to Joe's, 
And uh, they all just take an LSD that you might have been enjoying. I said, no, thanks. I just go sleep, go to sleep. I don't want to take the, join you on the LSD trip. No, thank you. So I went to sleep. And there was a few minutes later, maybe an hour later, so there's an impassioned knock on the door. They, they, Joe had gone crazy in LSD. He was running naked down the street, smashing windows, trying to smash car windows, windshields with his fist. He's going door to door saying, there's LSD in the water. He can give me a drink of water. They came to hide in my apartment. And Patrick said, chant this, it'll protect him. And he went, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Dama, Hare Dama, 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 Hare Hare. I went, wow. I visited the next day. So he showed me an article from the Saturday Evening Post about the Summer of Love in Haight Ashbury. It gave the whole mantra there in the Saturday Evening Post. So, wow, I got a picture of Krishna. I have it here. Let me get, let me show you. There's Radharani. Anyway, the uh, thing is, the smart, the AI is hiding it. But anyway, yeah. so. I read a Bhagavad Gita. If you, Krishna says, if you offer me a leaf, flower, or fruit, or water, I'll accept it. So I made a, a made a little altar. I was offering my food to Krishna, and it was an amazing thing. I realized, I never, my past, my ministers never told me you get offered something to God and you accept it. So I was feeling a whole amazing awakening within my heart. Just imagine the odds of this guy living two blocks away from me. I had no idea. That's That was mystical. And then he taught me this mantra, and I was offering my food, and it was I was in I could feel I was entering a different dimension of consciousness. So for me, taking up this pathway was I was getting mystical experiences to encourage me to go. Yes, this is where you should belong. Keep going. He's heading in this direction. You're going in the right direction. I was getting mystic, mystical confirmations. Uh, another thing happened. Maybe I can tell that one too. I visited Patrick. I was in Haight Ashbury. I went to go visit Patrick. I hitchhiked all the way from San Francisco to Denver. Then I was thinking maybe I can. I had. I left to buy. I left behind a motorbike in Denver. And maybe I can sell it and get money for a ticket. I want to and just fly instead of hitchhiking all the way. And um, so one of my friends, Beverly Copeland, her boyfriend, yeah, I'll buy your motorbike. Give you two hundred. I went to the airport. They had a student discount fare of two hundred bucks. The difficulty was I wasn't a student. So Melody's boyfriend lent me her ID so I could fly with his, his ID. And the ticket agent was suspicious. I don't think this is really you. I think you're faking it. Here, you sign here. To, she looked at my sign, the signature on his cards, and now you have to match the signature. <laughs> Can you imagine having to do that? So you know what happened? I signed, I matched the signature. That was mystical. That was mystical. And so I got a free, I got a ticket back to San Francisco. So I was getting in mystical experiences. They told me I was on the right path and things were going, and I was doing the right things. I got these mystical experiences one after another. <laughs> Absolutely. They, they are because we call them the miracles, coincidences, but those are mystical experiences. Yeah. It's all in the book. They can read all about the details in the book. Blessedbliss.com will take them in. Wonderful. I was going to ask what will readers get from reading the book, but that's one of the aspects is to learn more about your mystical experiences and what brought you to where you are now by reading the book. Yes. So how can we all become happier, um, I suppose, more victorious, more successful, even during very trying, challenging times? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the great saint Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he's written a song, he says in Cree, and Sukhe Duke Bula Vadane Harinam Kodrave in Bengali, which means whether you're miserable like hell, going through the, the, the horrible depression or failures, or you're in static bliss, um, just fill your lips with the holy name of God. That's what he advises. With miserable as hell, you're, you're dancing in ecstasy. Whatever state you're in, fill your lips with the holy name of God. So these holy names, these holy names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, they will take you to a new level of consciousness beyond the ups and downs of everyday life. Sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down. But this will take you beyond the ups and downs to a steady up that gets better and better and better. You're up and you're going higher and higher and higher. Chanting the names of God is the solution. If you're a Krishna, you can chant the name of Christ. 
You're a mouth of chant the name of Allah. Doesn't write in a manner the name, but chant the names of God, and your life will be mystically, magically transformed. A Buddhist can chant Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. You see, but ever, but whatever your path is, or if you don't have a path, try Hare Krishna. <laughs> it works. If it does. I will be doing it for half a century if it didn't work. I'm not a fool and idiot. They don't pay me to do this. I'm doing it because I'm experiencing something real. Something surreal is a better word for it. Yes, and millions of others experience what you do. Yeah, a very popular thing now. It's, in India, we have millions of followers in India now. Millions. I'm sure you have. Yes, absolutely. And if you, I want to talk about meditation with you. Now, uh, do you teach meditation? Do you guide people how to do it? This chanting is the topmost meditation. And we actually do it in, what we do is we have, we have singing and dancing sessions where we chant Hare Krishna and dance in ecstasy. This is the highest form of meditation. There's meditation. There is silent meditation, but this is more powerful. If you sit silently, your mind's going to wander here and there. If you're sitting there, but your mind is going here, 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 wandering here, wandering there. But this meditation, you can sing and dance in ecstasy and, and go to the highest level of meditation, but your mind gets totally absorbed. Meditation means absorb the mind and something sublime. That's what meditation means. You don't turn off your mind. Your mind is always active by nature. Some people want to turn off the mind in meditation, but they can't really turn it off. The mind is active by nature. So you have to fix your mind on something transcendental. And this, this chanting and dancing, or without the chanting and dancing, we also chant on beads early in the morning. The chant the names of God is the highest level of meditation recommended in this age by the great authorities. Mm. Yes, and the meditation, I like what you were saying, that the mind isn't always blank. It, it, you're, but I would imagine... Active by nature. The mind's nature is active. You can't turn off the mind. They say, turn off your mind, relax, and flow down the stream. It doesn't work. Mm. You need to fix your mind on something transcendental. That works very effectively. Yes, and I, I would say, too, when I'm meditating and there is a space where it feels as though there's nothing, there is still something because I'm aware that there's that space. So the yeah. mind is in awe. Yes, you're right. <laughs> they, they have a philosophy, nothing is real, right? Nothing is real. But then the statement, nothing is real, is also something. Yes. So it contradicts itself. Nothing is the highest truth. But that's the statement itself is something. So yes. you can't, nothingness only exists as a concept. It doesn't exist as a fact. Nothing is is something. It's a concept. So there's no such thing as pure nothingness in in the uh, doesn't actually exist except as a con imaginary con concept. Yeah, there is something. There's always something. So that's how we attain because we talk a lot about enlightenment. People wanting to reach enlightenment, and I'm very aware that now spirituality has taken upon the, this this moniker of uh, people getting higher or being higher. Or, you know, going above somehow. And I mean, what are your thoughts about that? People saying that they're trying to... Enlightenment, enlightenment begins, Ahamra me. I'm not this body, I'm a spiritual being. Enlightenment means, the first step of enlightenment is, is to kick off your misidentification with the temporary body. Actually, your body is changing at every minute. Every minute, the old blood corpuscles are dying, and the new blood corpuscles are take new blood corpuscles are taking their place. But you remain a constant factor. Even um, another interesting experiment: you say, point to your face, point to your ear, point to yourself. People on totally point to their chest. Why do they do them? You can take an experiment: get a thousand people, say, point to your ear, eyebrow, point to your knee, a point to yourself. They all point right here. Because intuitively we all know, and that's the Vedic science teaches us, the spiritual spark is actually situ situated in the heart. That's where the self actually exists. It's a tiny spark. It exists right there in the heart. You see. So you want to you want to get back to identifying as that spiritual spark. Um, um, that's who you actually are. You that spiritual being is sitting right now in your heart. It's called the Atma in Sanskrit. And you have to get back to realizing I'm the Atma and not this material body. The Atma, the self. That's where spiritual life begins. And then to understand what is relationship with Paramatma, the Supreme Self. Now you're 
Now this, that's the highest stage. So, so the first stage, I'm not this body, I'm the self. That's step one, one, one. And step number two or is to realize what is the uh, Actually, step number two is to realize what is the relationship between the individual self and the supreme self. Step number three is now to be actively engaged in that relationship. That's called bhakti or devotional service. And that is described in detail in the Bhagavad Gita. Yes, okay. That Yes. I, I mean, there's so much that I'm taking in. <laughs> so I'm sorry if I'm going a little bit slowly. But I'm just learning it all and taking it all in. Um, That's all right. We're, we're, getting, we're here to answer every question you can have, even if you have a thousand questions, I'll answer every one of them. Oh, that's that's very kind. I like the word bliss and your website, Blessed with Bliss. Yeah, Blessed with Bliss, yeah. <laughs> it's blissful. Um, why Blessed with Bliss? Um, <laughs> By 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 chanting by connecting with this process, it's a it's a blessing, and you're blessed with bliss. Mm. Right now, we're suffering in the material world, but the real bliss is to come back to your spiritual identity, and it's a great blessing if you can be if you can achieve bliss beyond all the sufferings of material existence. That's a great blessing. So, actually, it's not really a web page; it's a link that takes you to buying my book on Amazon. So, why are we? Why do we? fight against bliss and happiness and but because we, the thing is we don't we we look for bliss in the wrong in the wrong way we base our bliss on the body gratifying our bodily senses you see gratifying the tongue the belly the genitals we think this is how we can get bliss but this looking for bliss with the the uh, the tongue belly and the genitals it keeps us back in in the body identification with the material body, which is temporary, gets old and sick and dies. So you base your happiness on something which gets old, sick and dies. You're, you're, you're in the wrong, you're in a losing, you're in a losing battle. It's a losing battle. So I'm, I'm happy when I can eat, when I can have sex, that makes me happy. But that that's not who you actually are. That's just the body. You need to find your your real happiness is to find what actually satisfies the self within. And that, that, Self within is fully satisfied when that individual self revives his or her loving relationship with the supreme self. And that's better than sex or drugs or food or anything. Even money, power, and prestige. Yes, and yet people, maybe it's conditioning. They think that if they work a certain amount of hours that they will attain a certain amount of money, which I suppose is true. However, that's is that happiness? I, I don't know. We should base. We should not base our happiness on anything that is temporary, because that's a losing battle. If you relate, you base your happiness on something that is temporary, you're going to lose it. So base your happiness on something that is eternal, which is never taken away. That's that's called, that's science is called Krishna consciousness. How to base your happiness on something that is eternal, which is never taken away. Eternal, yes. And I, I don't know this, so I'm asking. I know uh, in Buddhism, they believe in life after death. Is that a concept in Krishna? In Buddhism, what? Uh, they believe in uh, the afterlife, life after death. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not um, uh, there is an afterlife after death, that's a thing. Yes. The body doesn't annihilate. The death is not annihilate the self. It simply annihilates the body. There is an afterlife. That's a thing. Yes, so the same concept, right? And that is it. Is it that the soul lives on? The soul moves on. The soul lives. The soul, on. The soul takes another body, or the soul either remains in this material world to take another body according to the karma laws of karma, or the soul returns to its original identity in the spiritual world. As one of two things happen. You either stay in the cycle of birth and death or you escape it. One of two things happen. If you're in an enlightened state of consciousness, if you awake, if you awaken love of God within your heart, then you go back to the spiritual world. Or if you have not awakened love of God, you still have material desires and you stay in the material world to fulfill those material desires. Okay. I, I'm familiar with that concept because I do believe in the afterlife. Um, but it, is this all, I often say, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong, I'm open always to learning. 
I often say it's our belief system. It's what we believe. Everybody believes something differently. So it sounds as though you are saying this is what you believe. This is your belief system. Now, this is beyond belief. Well, I believe the world is flat. Your belief don't make things true. It has to go beyond belief. The scientific fact is the earth is round. If someone believes it's flat, well, they're in, in a state of illusion. You, so it's not what you believe. It's what are the actual facts. Right, okay. Because science, you know, the whole idea of science is to keep experimenting, keep learning, keep researching. Yes, this area, religion or um, spirituality is all being researched a lot now. Um, but I wanted to just switch gears just for a second. Last couple of questions, if I may, please. People often, up in the area you grew up, mm -hmm. people were expanding their minds using substances. It was a big issue, big counterculture. It was accepted. It was something that was done. And for many years, it wasn't illegal. Now, I no. know people still do it, but... I find that meditation can often take you to a place. It's much better. Meditation is much better. Than I agree. Uh, I... The, the drugs are artificial. Yeah. Uh, the, the drugs can give you a sense that you have some existence beyond your body. That that was there. But uh, they can't really liberate you because your pen is still a material thing. And you see, that as long as you're, you're, as long as you're uh, dependent on some material thing, you stay in the material existence. So that's the that's the beauty of chanting Hare Krishna. It's not something material, like LSD or marijuana or peyote cactus. It's actually something transcendental. So if you chant you chant Hare Krishna, which is totally spiritual, it's not material at all. You can enter into the spiritual dimension. But if you're in LSD, then you can stay in them. You'll stay in the material realm. Okay, that's exactly that. And I suppose that's why it's un it's not sustainable. Yes. When um, people go crazy in LSD, like that boy Joe. He, he went door to door, he's naked. He says, Is there LSD in the water? Can you give me a drink of water? Can you imagine? That was his result of an LSD trip. Yeah. He went, went crazy, he became a complete nutcase by taking LSD. Absolutely. People's lives have been completely changed in some ways. You can ruin, completely ruined. You, you can go and become insane by the influence of LSD. Absolutely. Yes. And and just lastly here, because you've been very generous with your time, if somebody wanted to learn a bit more and take a course with you or come to a, a workshop, or what would they do? Do they go to your website and see? They can, uh, they can, everybody's welcome to write me. Go to sd at worldleader.com. sd at worldleader.com. They're welcome to write me. Oh, good. Okay, and you've got some publications out at divine108.com as well. Yeah, that they can go there and get a free copy of our book, uh, Easy Journey to Other Planets. Get a free download of a very nice book, Easy Journey, easy. Go to divine108.com and get a free copy of Easy Journey to Other Planets. That's a book my spiritual master wrote about how about this process you can be go to other planets. Tell them exactly how to uh, show them the, the pathway of becoming enlightened spiritual being, free from all the sufferings of material existence. It's been absolutely enlightening, is the best word I can use for this conversation. It is. The science is very enlightening as a event. I very much I'm teaching is very enlightening as a event. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been my great pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment and share the video on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow on your favorite social media platform. See you soon.